We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Good afternoon, everybody. A good turnout. Hello, those that are Zooming in and, and those that are going to be seeing this in the future. Uh, but welcome to the present. Uh, on behalf of Carta and all of my colleagues here at the Salk Institute, uh, welcome to what we call the Cathedral of Science. Uh, that's how we think of our, our beautiful Salk Institute. Um, so um, today's Carta Symposium uh, is uh, following in the tradition of the big questions we all like to ask together. Such as, and in particular, we focus in these symposia and in Carta on the questions of where did we come from and how did we get here, and that's anthropogeny. How we explain the nature of and, and, and path of the origin of humans. And I think why we all find this not just intellectually stimulating, but in a collegial sense stimulating is because different disciplines convene on this problem within the context of CARTA and these symposia. It's where uh, chemists and biological scientists and philosophers and uh, everything in between, uh, including mathematicians, I guess they're on the side, uh, come together to, to address these big questions together. Uh, CARTA is the uh, Center for Academic Research and Training in Anthropogeny. Uh, it's co-sponsored by UCSD and the Salk Institute since its origins, um, and it's topic is origins to exp uh, explore and explain the origins of the human phenomenon. Uh, I am one of the co-directors of CARTA, our fearless leader who's going to be out here shortly is Pascal and Katarina is here as well and our associate directors. Uh, and you saw this on the scroll, but just to again thanks our, our uh, major sponsors for CARTA. So these are perpetual sponsors of CARTA uh, in memoriam for Annette Merrill Smith, the Varkey family and an anonymous donor. Uh, CARTA's benefactors and patrons, and then specifically uh, in support of today's symposia, we want to thank these individuals, friends and supporters of CARTA, and we also have support for the closed captioning of these symposia as they're then presented both live and, and in perpetuity on the web. Um, you can also help support this and future symposia by going to the, the CARTA website and dialing into support and then dialing in your dollars. Uh, and then for today, we want to thank our, our uh, staff, uh, both the CARTA staff at UCSD, uh, at San Diego Supercomputer Center and UCSD TV that enable the recording and propagation of, of what's going to happen here over the next uh, several hours, uh, and our own team here at SOC and SOC Media Services, uh, Aaron, uh, Mike, and Kent. Guarantee everything will go smooth as silk, because it always does. So we're now up to something like 42 million individual views of the past symposia. Every time there's a CARTA symposia, thanks to UCSD and San Diego Supercomputer Center and other sponsors, it's made available on the web. Uh, we've now cracked the 42 million mark. We're, it's like McDonald's. We're going to change the sign to 50 million and counting when we get there. Uh, you can access, again, from the main CARTA website, any of the previous uh, symposia, which, which you will find there. Uh, and that brings us to today. So uh, today, is, is the, the general topic is comparative anthropogeny. 
Uh, and the, uh, the co-chairs for today are, as I've already mentioned, Pascal Gagnon, our, our fearless leader, card executive uh, co-director. He'll be out here in just a second. And Carol Marchetto, who is a, a Saki. Uh, she was a postdoc in Rusty Gage's lab. Uh, Rusty was one of the co-founders of, of CARTA. She was a postdoc in Rusty Gage's lab and, of course, now is on the faculty in anthropology at UCSD. So they are the con convening today. I'm turning it over to Pascal to actually get on with the program. Once again, on behalf of CARTA and the Salk Institute, Welcome. Thank you very much. It, it, thank you, Kent. Thank you very much for, uh, for this welcome. And uh, on my behalf, welcome to all of you, uh, both out there in the, in the sphere and here in the room. So the topic today is comparative anthropogeny and other approaches to uh, human origins. There is a lot of ways you can compare things at a lot of different levels. Taking a planetary level, uh, you can ask the question, where do you find modern humans and where do you find our closest living relatives, the great apes? And you will notice that humans are all over the place, uh, now 8 billion, and each species of great ape is restricted to tropical forests somewhere in the tropics of Africa or Southeast Asia. But we know based on DNA comparisons that two of these apes, these non-humans, are actually more closely related to humans than they are to the other so-called apes. But even though they're closely related to us, we are the species that is currently driving climate change and we are the species currently causing the sixth mass extinction on the planet. So that alone to me justifies to try to ask questions about what is it about this one ape species that you know, allowed it to reach global dominance and now endanger its own existence. I'm not even measuring, uh, mentioning the threat of, of nucle nuclear disaster that is rather close. So the levels of comparative approaches you can take is you can be interested in anatomy, in physiology, or in behavior. And this is a figure from a, a review that uh, we published earlier this year. And it shows you that there seems to be more to explain uh, along the lineage of the bipedal apes that eventually led to humans. Uh, there are all kinds of things we will discuss today briefly as well that are clearly derived in chimpanzees and bonobos. But in terms of anatomy, physiology, and, and behavior, tons of things have seemed to have changed more so in the lineage leading to us. If you ask yourself, how did you start your day today? You woke up to an alarm clock, then you flipped a switch to, to uh, lighten up your, your, your residence, then you took a shower, and used soap, possibly shaved, then brushed your teeth using a mirror, then flossed, then went for a nature walk, or meditated, or did some yoga or surfed, which combines all these three things, uh, then rode a vehicle in, hopefully, to come here, thought about friends, uh, texted with friends, or talked to people using their names, their personal names. That's a dozen things that are not known in any non-human species. So it, it's endless, the list of things that you can only see in our species. And it's sometimes hard to decide where to start. And so today, we'll have a kind of smorgasbord of levels of comparative analysis. We start with Brenna Hen, who will talk about population genetics of populations that have not been well studied until recently and show that comparing the genetic composition of present day fellow humans in South Africa opens up some windows on big enigmas that we hadn't uh, appreciated until recently. Then we will have Carl Marchetto, my co-chair today, who will walk you through neural maturation, not in the brain of an ape and a human, but the closest possible thing we can have in the lab. These are neuronal cells derived from induced pluripotent stem cells that can be derived from, from skin cells. And she will report some very interesting differences in how neurons maturate. Mark Collard will, will um, talk about ethnography where the level of analysis is within humans between different societies that have been described mostly by Western ethnographers with all their biases, but providing nonetheless extremely precious insight into both the prejudices of the Western ethnographers and really important differences between how humans form societies. Then we'll talk about ants. It turns out when you address these uniquely human features, again and again, you find things only humans do, from architecture to warfare to slavery to caste system to sharing food to air conditioning. The only other living things that have these things are the, the eusocial insects that have, of course, developed these things millions of years earlier than us. And this, by the way, is me trying to convince my young daughter, who's now 15, that ants are nothing to fear. She doesn't fear ants, but she hates cockroaches. 
then we'll have Andy Shork talk about Neanderthal genes that are present in the genome of some humans, but not all humans. So by definition, we did not become modern humans because some of us have Neanderthal genes, but they do some interesting things. We will hear from uh, Tatum Simonson about human populations in different places that have repeatedly adapted to survive in very high altitude, where one of the biggest problems is what pregnant mothers can do in terms of sharing oxygen with their fetuses. Then I will talk about concealed ovulation. It turns out I'll probably talk more about conspicuous ovulation than about concealed ovulation. Corinna Most will then talk about interbirth intervals where human mothers do the impossible even long before farming, despite having children that are very difficult to birth and developing very, very slowly. They manage to give birth to these infants in a much faster way, uh, every three years as opposed to every six years, which kind of explains the, the, the satellite image I showed you at the beginning. Humans are now eight billions and all over the planet, the great apes restricted to forests. And then we'll end with Eva Wittenberg addressing the probably most diagnostic of all features of humans, which is language, our, which allows us to share brains, tell stories, tell lies, manipulate others, and celebrate heroes, and so forth. And I'd like to point out to you that today is a very special symposium because we have two speakers who actually are graduates from our uh, graduate uh, specialization in anthropogeny. Corina Most, who's on the faculty of Iowa State at Ames, will talk about interbirth interval. This is Corina in 2014 in Addis Ababa, looking at the skull, the real thing, not a cast, of Herto Man, one of the oldest modern humans, 160,000 years old. And uh, Bahan Asfa, Dr. Bahan Asfa, who is a Carta member, kindly invites us to, to see these original fossils. She also found out how chimpanzee nests are studied by climbing vertically with the help of Dr. Fiona Stewart. And Andrew Shork is looking through a two million year old vertebra of a giraffe at Olduvai Gorge at the Zinch site. And he also got the opportunity to go hunting with some Hadza tribes people uh, near Lake Ayasi. So I'm extremely happy that we kind of close the circle and have people from the next generation talking today. And then I will end by reminding you that we need help. <laughs> and if you think of ways to help, of someone that might help us, uh, if you want these series to continue and to remain free for everyone, uh, please uh, consider supporting us. <laughs>